Hi there. Well, if you have been with us uh, during the season of Lent, uh, the 40 days, not counting Sundays that lead up to Easter, we know that the, you will know that we as a church have been uh, taking a journey through the Gospel of Matthew with daily readings and daily devotions. And if you've been doing that, if you've been following us, you realize that we, met, we, you, we skipped over the Palm Sunday of Scripture because we were saving it for today. And that's what our focus is on today. We're at the day that Jesus entered into the gates, humbly riding on a donkey. So let's, let's look at that passage in the Gospel of Matthew that describes Jesus entry into this, to the city. Of fully know what's going to happen to him, his arrest, his trial, and ultimately his painful death on the cross. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus gave two disciples a task. He said to them, go into the village over there. As soon as you enter, you will find a donkey tied up and a colt with you. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the master needs them. He sent them off right away. Now this happened to fulfill what the prophet had said. Say to daughter Zion, look, Your king is coming, humble and riding on a donkey, and on a colt the donkey's offspring. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them. Then he sat on them. Now a large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others cut palm branches off the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds in front of them and behind him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed on the one who who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Who is this? They asked. The crowds answered, it's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now you could say on this first Palm Sunday, everybody was coming to Jerusalem and some people were expecting a showdown, right? Jesus had been bringing the message of God's love and peace to the masses, to the people, in a very powerful way. People have been deserved as many miracles and his healings. They have listened and rapture to his teachings, his full stories and examples uh, that he's shared, and the parables that contain compelling truths. Yet his teachings and his actions didn't go over well with some people. Those would be the religious leaders or the political leaders. On the first Palm Sunday, everyone seems to have a foreboding that something is going to happen this weekend. All eyes are on Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem humbly on a donkey amidst the shouts of praise to him. Today, the masses are singing God's praise among the shouts of hallelujah. In about four days, they'll be demanding the masses to crucify him, crucify him. Now, all faithful Jews would know that people would be normally gathering in Jerusalem in masses at this time, the 15th day of Nisan. No, not the car. That's, that's a month in the Hebrew calendar, Nisan. They would be gathering to celebrate the festival of Passover. Passover marks is a Jewish festival in the spring which commemorates the liberation of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. It really almost kind of is like the birth of their nation as a Jewish nation. So all Jewish males were required to make three pilgrimages to Jerusalem. If they could, if they could, if they weren't too far away. And they're all connected with, with the people's deliverance from slavery in Egypt, which we call the Exodus. There's Pentecost, which celebrates the culmination of that Exodus as they, as they, as they uh, are there at the, at, the mount, at the foot of Mount Sinai. There's the Festival of Booths and Tabernacles, which commemorates the whole journey, their 40-year journey after leaving Egypt, where they constructed makeshift tents along their journey. And, of course, there's Passover, which we're celebrating today. So at this time when Jesus entered the city, it was busting at the seams. as A multitude of Jewish people were gathering for the festival, including Jesus. You remember he was a faithful Jew. For many had made this trip numerous times every year as being devoted followers of God. You could almost say that the trip was sort of getting routine for them. Each year was the same thing, the same route they took, the same rituals at the temple, the the same prayers. 
what should have been a high holy day for the Jewish people had lost its appeal to some. It had become stale and rote. They were just going through the motions. For many, it was a great burn to travel so far away from their homeland, leaving their livelihood and their families behind. At this point, they were clamoring for something new, something more than what their religion was offering. Enter Jesus. Reports of his teachings, his healing, his faithful followers that trailed him everywhere, and his confrontations with religious and political leaders have been spreading, spreading throughout the land. Couple that with those rumors that he was the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior, the Deliverer that prophets of old had been foretelling about for centuries. Suddenly, with great hope and expectations, this this trip to to for uh, Passover was more exciting. Here was one who would give them what their religion could not give. As cherished as their traditions, their rituals, their the temple rites were, m- many people began to sense that there was something lacking, something lacking. Jesus could possibly be the one who could fill the emptiness that they were feeling in their religion. Jesus could be the one they had been expecting. And everyone was clamoring to get a glimpse of him. You can see on this very first Palm Sunday, the attraction was more for Jesus than it was for the religious observance. Jesus had an appeal. He had an appeal to the common folk, the least, the last, and the lost. If we read in Mark 12, 37, that he was teaching one day in the temple, and the large crowd listened to him with delight. They listened to him with delight. What delight? They were filled with delight at what he was saying. Now, now, had there ever been anyone else who drew such a reaction with the crowds? Delight. So on this first Palm Sunday... In Jerusalem, known as the city of David, we can say that all eyes were on Jesus. He was the one attracting interest, attracting attention. Jesus was more attractive than their religious systems because the religious systems had moved away from the heart of God. On the first Palm Sunday, it was a confrontation, a clash between the old and the new. We can see that in Jesus' clash with the religious leaders, the Pharisees, that we read in Matthew 15, over the observances of one of their laws. Now, one of their laws in this passage, one of their laws is Jesus' disciples were transgressing the use of the purification traditions of the elders by not washing their hands before they eat. You thought that came from your mom, but that's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. Yet Jesus calls them out asking, Why is it then you transgress the commandments by your traditions? You see, their religious traditions allowed them to find a loophole so that they did not have to adhere to the commandment to honor thy mother and thy father. So they found a workaround, which gave them a pass from the command to provide for their parents. Jesus is saying, come on, really, guys? Do you think that's what my father wanted when he made this command? This is, is this the heart of my father? Why is it that you are transgressing my, the commandments of God by your traditions? And you accuse me of transgressing the traditions by my commandments. So on this day of Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem, humbly on a donkey, the attraction for the common people was for Jesus. They were not interested in all the religious going on, the political or social undertones that were that time represented what was going on behind the scenes. They just wanted to see Jesus. So what was the attraction of Jesus on that first Palm Sunday? Now let me give you four possibilities of the attraction of Jesus. First of all, religion emphasizes the outward. Jesus emphasized the inward. It's not your outward actions that matter, but the condition of your heart that motivates your actions that is significant. That was Jesus was represented. That's what Jesus was teaching. It's what a matter of your heart, not what comes out of your mouth. No, what are your actions? It's the motivation behind it. Second, religion is about what you cannot do. Jesus is about what you can do. You think of religion sometimes as all these should nots, would not, you know, all the, all the knots. Don't do this, don't do that. Restrictive rules. There's some of that there. 
But with Jesus, the possibilities, the, the, the emphasis on the possibilities are available in the life that Jesus offers. What you can do, not what you can't do. What you can't do. Religion puts up barriers. Jesus pulls down barriers. Jesus was focused on bringing people in, not keeping people out because they were not one of us. One of us. He was bringing down barriers, which which upset some of the religious leaders. And the last one, Jesus says, work your way. Religion says, I am the way. Religion says, work your way. Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus' way was simple. Just follow me. Follow me. Salvation is offered freely as an unconditional gift. There's nothing we need to do to earn it. Nothing we need to do to be worthy of it, to earn that gift. It is offered to all not just a select few. Follow Jesus. He is the way. There's no need to work your way into God's grace. Okay, I'm going to have a brief aside here, and, and I trust me, I'm coming back to the point. And this has to do something with the point, okay? If someone were to ask you, what is your favorite musical group of all time? Could you name it? Just yell it out. What's your favorite group of all time? Come on, the audience participate. I hear a lot of the Beatles. What are, what are some of the other ones? Bon Jovi, I heard that. You know, there's a multitude of answers to that. I mean, you, you could choose from rock and roll, country and western, R&B, jazz, oldies, even classical orchestras. Somebody named that in the first service. Or you could just say you're talking about bands that are current now are the bands that I grew up with that I have fond memories of. There's a multitude. It's kind of a, it's kind of a hard question to answer. But I want to say I have a definitive answer to that question. My favorite group of all time is a group you've probably never heard of, and it's got probably the worst name for a band ever. It's called Asleep at the Wheel. Oh, y'all have heard of that. Oh, my God, just very good. That 815 crowd just scratched their head and looked at me. Yeah. So the group started out in the 1960s as a group of hippies living out in a bus in West Virginia and eventually moved to the honky-tonk bars of Austin, Texas. And it's kind of hard to describe what, what kind of music they have because you could say Western swing, you could say country western, you could even say there's a little bit of jazz, a little bit of rock and roll splashed in there. Clear as mud, right? Clear as mud. I dragged Jane to one of the concerts when they were playing in Orlando. We walked in, and Jane looked around at the crowd. We had maybe been one of the youngest ones there, and the rest of them looked like long-haired ex-hippies with gray hair our contingent of cowboy boot and cowboy hat wearing beer swinging rednecks. The look on Jane's face was one of a mixture of fear combined with, who is this person that I married? Yet it isn't the outward appearance of the band or the clientele that follows them or, or the types of venues they perform or the type of music, that, nor their checkered past that appeals to me. It's their music. I love their music. You remember American Bandstand? It's got a good beat. It's easy to dance to. That's kind of why I look. It's, it's wonderful. It's a great music. It's the music that I like. If you look at the appearance of the band, you can probably make some assumptions about me or try to infer some assumptions about me, but you missed the point. It's all about the music. The music is wonderful, right? Now, we can say the same thing about the first Palm Sunday. The crowds massed to Jerusalem for a variety of reasons. It was their religious duty, or they came for political reasons, or they came because everyone else was going to be there. They wanted to see what was going to come in to culminate with this clash of the old guard and this new voice of the people. They wanted to witness a, a rumble of epic proportions. Or they wanted to see this voice silenced because they thought he was a religious heretic. Yet for most people there, they just wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus, the one who was to give them hope for their desperate lives, a man who was to come from God embodied with love to offer them grace, mercy, forgiveness from their burdens, what they sorely needed in those times or what we sorely need. Salvation from their sinful lives that weighed them down. 
that is all still offered to us today. The world today can be too overly focused on the outward appearance of religion. You know, we've got politics going on in the churches. We've got divisions going on in the churches. And the divisions are making headlines. The, the, the abuses that have occurred, the misconduct, the hypocrisy that exists within them. I hear that a lot. I don't go to church because there are a bunch of hypocrites there. Well, you know, some people just don't like organized religion. And I, I, I want to say I've been in a church for 25 years. We're not that organized. So... So, yet when we focus on the baggage of religion, we can miss the heart of the religion, Jesus. He is the one we are to be attracted to, where our allegiances should be entrusted, who we should put our faith in, the inward heart of our faith, not the outward appearance of it. That is what attracted the crowds on that very first Palm Sunday. They wanted to see Jesus, who gave them hope. Jesus did not come to be just a great religious teacher with a great philosophy for life. He came to fulfill God's plan for, for us. That by dying on the cross, he was to reconcile uh, us with God and with each other. A ministry of reconciliation. Something that humanity could not do on its own, though what he kept trying to do, and we still keep trying to do. And to do it for the sake of everyone. So that we can live the abundant life that God created us to have. Full of grace, mercy, love, and that peace that passes all understanding. That can only come from God. So I think this passage in Colossians says it well. Because all the fullness of God was pleased to live in him, and he reconciled all things to him through him, whether things on earth or in heavens, he brought peace to the blood of his cross. So as we journey with Jesus through this holy week that leads up to Easter, let us not get sidetracked by all the distractions or the outward appearance of this week are there all the religious formalities that get us skewed from what is the true focus of our this week? To simply follow Jesus. Fix our gaze on him, the one who will lead us to abundant and eternal life. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we come to you here at the beginning of Holy Week, Lord, we, we, we seek your son's presence. We seek your, your word to our life. We don't seek specifically religion. We seek Jesus. Let us put our eyes on, on, on Jesus. Let us focus our gaze on him. Let Jesus speak to our hearts. Let us, we follow him. And all these excuses that we make for not being a Christian, for not coming to church, those are just distractions. Those are just the structures. The heart is Jesus. Let us see Jesus. Let us hear his voice. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.